Imagine getting paid just for sharing your thoughts on products and services you use every day. With Survey Junkie, it's that simple. Click on the link in the video description to discover how you can start earning today by taking surveys. Question. When did black become de rigueur for funerals? Black was the color for morning dress dating back to the Roman Empire, when the toga pola, made of dark-colored wool, was worn. However, in Britain, white or brown was worn by commoners. Black or purple was reserved for the nobility. There were two factors that set black apart, its cost and sumptuary laws. To achieve black or purple hues required multiple rounds of costly dyeing, using the red roots of matter and the blue leaves of woad. Sumptuary laws imposed a fine on those attempting to copy the fashion choices of the nobility. For the nobility, funeral garb was an expression of both wealth and fashion. After the deaths of her father-in-law, mother and first husband, Francis II of France between July 1559 and December 1560, Mary, Queen of Scots, wore a form of mourning called en duel blanc, involving a white pleated cambric veil. By the Georgian era, sumptuary laws were abolished and wealthy commoners began to wear black as a status symbol. Black became customary in the West in all classes thanks to Queen Victoria. When her husband Prince Albert died in 1861, she wore black clothing for the remaining 40 years of her life. Corinne Jackson, Liverpool Question, how involved were the mafia in the American music industry? The Mafia had a hand in various aspects of the music industry, but never gained any particular control of major record companies. From the 1920s, the Mafia owned or controlled many nightclubs and venues where artists performed, especially in cities like New York. In the 1940s, over two-thirds of all record sales were aimed at the jukebox industry. These proved a perfect way to launder money. It is said the mob accountant Meyer Lansky controlled every Wurlitzer jukebox in the New York area through the MB Distributing Company. However, the figure most often connected to both pop music and organized crime was the impresario Morris Levy. Levy founded the legendary Birdland Jazz Club, regularly hosting names like Charlie Parker and Count Basie. He owned a record pressing factory and the Strawberries Records tape stores, but soon recognized that the real money was to be made in music publishing. To that end, he founded Roulette Records and various minor labels, producing a mix of pop, R&B, and jazz. He became notorious for hiding profits or falsely claiming writing credits while allegedly laundering money for New York's Genovese crime family. One of his victims was Tommy James of Tommy James and the Shondells fame, who had major hits with the songs Money Money and I Think We're Alone Now. James, in his book Me, The Mob, and The Music, estimated that Levy had fiddled him out of $40 million in royalties. He accused Levy of strong-arming artists into terrible contracts, buying up the rights to old hits and suing anyone who infringed on his copyright. Morris Levy's career came to an end in 1988 when he was convicted for conspiring to extort John Lamont, a Philadelphia-area record distributor, and sentenced to 10 years in jail. Bail was set at $3 million. Levy lost his appeal in 1990 and died before he could go to prison. Jack Cox, Morcom, Lanx. Question, were plebs able to reach the higher echelons of Roman society? There were three principal classes in Roman society, the patricians, aristocrats and elites, the plebeians, free common citizens, and the slaves, individuals without rights. There were routes for a plebeian to enter the patrician class. A plebeian could be adopted into a patrician family if there were no male heirs. The Roman law of succession recognized a hay race necessarius, a necessary heir, usually the eldest son, who would inherit the bulk of the estate. A patrician would adopt a son, often his own with one of his slaves, or from one of his favored plebeian clients, to continue his legacy. Under the empire, a plebeian could also be ennobled by imperial decree, per rescriptum principis. This might happen when a city senate had too few members. Plebeians could also reach high levels in Roman society without promotion to the patrician class. Prominent plebeian families regularly held the consulship and were influential in the senate. For example, Gaius Marius was a successful military leader and a plebeian who became a consul seven times. Cicero was a plebeian who rose to become a consul and one of Rome's greatest orators and statesmen. Mr. C. Greenwood, Solihull,